Ted Bundy, a dark figure in criminal history, hid a gruesome secret behind his charming facade. Today we take you on a journey through the shadows of a serial killer. A story of a dark past and tragic events that ultimately led to his execution. Theodore Robert Bundy was born on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. His unmarried mother, Louise Cowell, claimed that Jack Worthington, a war veteran, was his father, whom Bundy never got to know. In his first four years, Bundy lived with his mother at the Methodist grandparents Samuel and Eleanor Cowell in Philadelphia. To avoid the societal stigma of having an illegitimate child, the grandparents pretended to be Bundy's parents, leading him to believe that his mother was his sister. It was only years later that he discovered his true identity from his birth certificate. Samuel Cowell, known for racism and violence, was even speculated to be Ted Bundy's possible father. In 1950, Louise Cowell moved with her son to Tacoma, Washington, where she met John Bundy and married him in May 1951. John adopted Ted, and the couple had four children together. The relationship between Ted and his adoptive father was strained, and Bundy eventually refused to accept John as his father. Bundy attended Woodrow Wilson High School in Tacoma excelling academically but being a loner with an unpredictable temperament. He showed little interest in romantic relationships and was disappointed when he wasn't accepted into any of the school teams. Instead, he discovered skiing and secretly acquired the necessary equipment. After graduating in 1965, Bundy studied for a year at the University of Puget Sound then switched to the University of Washington in Seattle in 1966 to study Asian studies. His academic performance declined, leading to a brief switch to urban planning, which was also unsuccessful. In 1967, his first girlfriend broke up with him, and Bundy temporarily left the university. In 1968, he dropped out, spent a semester at Temple University in Philadelphia, and returned to Washington in the fall of 1969. There, he started a relationship with Elizabeth Klopfer, enrolled again at the University of Washington to study psychology, and worked part-time at a suicide hotline. Bundy became politically active and completed his psychology degree in 1972. He then took law courses at the University of Puget Sound, later transferring to the University of Utah's law school and converting to Mormonism. In the murky chapter of Ted Bundy's history, the exact beginning of his murder spree remained shrouded in uncertainty, marked by contradictory statements from the perpetrator. The first crimes he confessed to include the murder of an unknown hitchhiker in May 1973 in Olympia. However, it was in 1974 that the disappearances of young women in the state of Washington intensified. Linda Healy 21 years old, became the tragic start of this nightmare. On January 31, 1974, Bundy broke into her student residence in Seattle, abducted her, and took her to Taylor Mountain, where he raped and killed her. A horrific crime that foreshadowed the shadows of his later deeds. March 12, 1974 marked the disappearance of Donna Manson, a 19-year-old woman on her way to a concert. 
Bundy once again left a painful void in the hearts of loved ones. The tragedy continued. On April 17, 1974, 18-year-old Susan Rancourt disappeared on her way to a film screening in Ellensburg. Also disturbing was the account of a witness who told the police about a man with a cast on his arm. She encountered three days earlier at the entrance to the library at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg. His mask of seeking help concealed the dark secret he harbored. The witness, carrying books to his VW Beetle, noticed the missing front passenger seat. When the man abruptly asked her to get into the car, she escaped in haste. Another mysterious disappearance occurred on May 6, 1974, in the state of Oregon, when 22-year-old Roberta Parks did not return from her walk in Corvallis. The ambiguity and eerie atmosphere surrounding Bundy deepened. On June 1, 1974, Brenda Ball disappeared on her way home from a pub in Berrien. Ten days later, the trail of George Ann Hawkins went cold as she was on her way from a friend's house to her sorority in Seattle. A shadow of fear cast over the city. The Seattle Times, for the first time, dared to suggest a possible connection to the Healy case. Witnesses also came forward, reporting a man on crutches at the site of Hawkins' disappearance. The puzzle took shape as the description of this man matched the owner of the VW Beetle with the cast on his arm, seen in Ellensburg on April 14, 1974. A network of observations and clues surrounded the mysterious events, and people began to realize they were in the clutches of a merciless perpetrator. The emerging suspicion of a serial killer was initially treated with restraint by the authorities. However, a turning point occurred on July 14, 1974, at Lake Sammamish in King County, when two young women, Janice O.T.T. and Denise Narslund, disappeared mysteriously. Among the approximately 40,000 people frequenting the lake that day, Several eyewitnesses observed a man with a cast on his arm. This stranger approached young women, introducing himself as Ted. Reports from some approached women indicated that he asked for help loading his VW Beetle. A witness even saw Janice OTT leaving with him. After the police developed a clearer profile of the suspected perpetrator and released a detailed description, a public manhunt for the man named Ted, driving a VW Beetle, was launched. The concerned population responded with thousands of calls, and every suspicion was pursued. Interestingly, the tip about the politically engaged law student Ted Bundy was initially dismissed as rather unlikely. The common features of the missing women, youth, attractiveness, and a middle-parted hairstyle led to the assumption that the cases might be connected. The police identified a temporal pattern. Ted regularly selected his victims at approximately monthly intervals. Surprisingly, the expected news in August did not materialize, and it was only in early September 1974 that the first shocking discoveries were made. In a remote wooded area near Issaquah, hunters made a gruesome discovery, human bones. Forensic analysis, using x-rays and dental records, identified these remains as those of the missing women Janice OTT and Denise Narslund. But not only that, at the site where the two women were found, the mortal remains of a third woman were also discovered, whose identity could unfortunately not be determined. The tragedy continued when, in March 1975, body parts of Brenda Ball, Susan Rancourt, Roberta Parks, and Linda Healy were scattered on Taylor Mountain near Issaquah. 
In the fall of 1974, the series of missing persons in Washington came to an end. Investigating authorities suspected that the killer might have changed his operating area. Indeed, Ted Bundy had already switched to the University of Utah at that time, explaining his disappearance from the region. On October 2, 1974, 16-year-old student Nancy Wilcox disappeared in a suburb of Salt Lake City. She was last seen getting into a passing VW Beetle. About two weeks later, 17-year-old Melissa Smith, the one-year-old daughter of the police chief in the nearby town of Midvale, also disappeared without a trace. According to witnesses, she was hitchhiking. Smith's naked body was found ten days later in a gorge. The autopsy revealed a skull fracture and severe blood loss. It could not be ruled out that the victim had lived for up to a week after her disappearance. The medical examiner also determined that Melissa Smith had been raped. In the Halloween night of 1974, 17-year-old Laura Ain disappeared after a party in Orem. Her body was later found on November 27 of the same year in a mountainous area near Salt Lake City. Another incident illustrates that not all murder attempts by Ted Bundy were successful. On November 7, 1974, he approached 19-year-old Carol Dieronch in a shopping center in Murray. He identified himself as Officer Roseland from the local police and claimed that Dieronch's car had been broken into. Under the pretext of taking her to the station, he showed a badge and invited her into his VW Beetle. During the ride, he suddenly tried to handcuff her and threatened her with a weapon. However, Dieronch managed to free herself from the car during the drive and promptly reported the incident to the Murray police. On the same day, Deborah Kent also disappeared after attending a play at Viewmorn High School in Bountiful, just a few miles north of Murray. She was last seen during the play's intermission on her way to the school parking lot. A 24-year-old teacher later told the police that she had noticed a man sitting behind the Kent during the performance. This stranger had approached her several times before the play began, trying to get her to the parking lot under some pretext. On January 12, 1975, nurse Karen Campbell disappeared while skiing with her boyfriend in Snowmass near Aspen. Witnesses had last seen the young woman alone on her way to her hotel room, but she never reached her destination. In March 1975, her frozen body was discovered on an unpaved road near Snowmass Village. The results of the autopsy indicated fatal head trauma from blunt force. About two months later, ski instructor Julie Cunningham disappeared without a trace in Vale. Equally mysteriously, 25-year-old Denise Oliver Sun vanished on April 6, 1975, in Grand Junction. She was last seen alive when she rode her bicycle home after visiting her boyfriend. Her bicycle was later found under a road overpass, but Oliver Sun was missing. In the early morning hours of August 16, 1975, Ted Bundy was stopped by the police in Granger, Utah, for speeding and disregarding several stop signs. During the inspection of his VW Beetle, the officers noticed that the front passenger seat was placed on the back seat. Additionally, they discovered suspicious items such as a crowbar, an ice pick, handcuffs, and a stocking mask. This led to the issuance of an arrest warrant, and Bundy was arrested on August 21, 1975, for possession of burglary tools. In the days leading to his arrest, investigators suspected Bundy in the kidnapping of Carol Dieronch on November 7, 1974. 
During a lineup on October 2, 1975, D.A. Ronch identified Bundy as the man who posed as Officer Roseland. Consequently, Bundy was charged with kidnapping and attempted murder, and his bail was set at $100,000. After seven weeks in jail, his bail was reduced to $15,000, and it was posted by his parents. The trial began on February 23, 1976, at the Salt Lake City Courthouse and ended on March 1, 1976, with a guilty verdict. Bundy was sentenced to a prison term of up to 15 years, with the possibility of a parole hearing in less than three years. While Ted Bundy served his sentence in the Utah State Prison, investigators worked to prove his involvement in the murder of Karen Campbell in Colorado. During a search of his apartment, the police had seized a ski brochure in which the Wildwood Inn, where Campbell had stayed, was marked with a cross. Furthermore, his credit card statement showed that on January 12, 1975, the day of Campbell's disappearance, he had refueled in Glenwood Springs, 40 miles north of Aspen. In the trunk of the VW Beetle, investigators found a hair with a structure similar to Campbell's. After a witness came forward, who had seen Bundy at the Wildwood Inn on crutches, he was charged with the murder of Karen Campbell in October 1976. In January 1977, Bundy was extradited to Colorado. Bundy insisted on representing himself. For this reason, he was granted permission during a court appearance on June 7, 1977, at the Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen, to move freely without handcuffs and shackles. During a break in the proceedings, he was allowed to visit the courthouse's legal library. In an unattended moment, he jumped out of a first-floor window and escaped. He hid in the mountains for a week before being caught again when he was pulled over in a stolen car. In December 1977, Bundy escaped once more, this time from the prison in Glenwood Springs. After committing at least three more murders in Florida, including the attack on the Chi Omega sorority house, he was arrested again on February 15, 1978. Following a trial where he was found guilty of triple murder, he was sentenced to death. While Bundy awaited the repeatedly postponed execution of the death penalty in prison, another death sentence was imposed on him in a separate trial. On February 9, 1980, Bundy and Carol and Boone took the opportunity during the trial for his final murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach to exchange marriage vows in court. Since this action took place in court, the marriage was recognized as valid. During his imprisonment, their daughter Rose was conceived and born in October 1982. Shortly before an originally scheduled execution date in July 1986, his wife visited him with their daughter. However, she left Bundy in the same year, just before another postponed execution date, and did not return. The fourth execution date was set for January 17, 1989, and was only delayed because Bundy was now finally confessing. Among other things, he told the police where the bodies of Donna Manson and George Ann Hawkins, missing since 1974, could be found. Then he tried to further delay the execution under the pretext of making more confessions. Additionally, he granted an interview to evangelical psychologist James Dobson on the day before his execution. 
On January 24, 1989, at 7.16 a.m. EST, Bundy was executed on the electric chair at the Florida State Prison. Half an hour after his execution, a vehicle with Bundy's remains left the prison for the crematorium, followed by a cheering crowd. In accordance with his wish, Bundy's ashes were scattered in the mountains of the Cascade Range in the state of Washington. In Ted Bundy's dark chapter of criminal history, the suffering he caused is unforgettable. As we uncomfortably recall his deeds, let us not forget the names and faces of the victims whose lives he cruelly ended. This story serves as a reminder that evil sometimes appears unassuming. It urges us to be mindful as we navigate through life and to appreciate the well-being of those around us. May the memory of the victims inspire us to promote justice and compassion in our own actions and decisions. That's it for the video. Feel free to leave a like and a follow to support me for free and help reach the first 1000 subscribers as quickly as possible. Thank you for your support.